Good afternoon and welcome to today's presentation, Billing for Behavioral Health, Top 5 Issues Facing Agencies in 2018. Today's executive web briefing is brought to you by the ECHO Group and Open Minds. During our 90 minutes together, we will focus on the upcoming changes and challenges for behavioral health billing in 2018. Our presenter, Suki Norris, Senior Knowledge Engineer at the ECHO Group, will also share information on understanding specific reimbursement methodologies based not only on the services provided, but also the related clinical outcomes. Suki Norris is the Senior Knowledge Engineer at ECHO Group, which provides industry-leading EHR, billing software, managed care, and revenue cycle management products and services. Suki has more than 35 years of experience in healthcare, including healthcare law, managed care, and behavioral health. Suki has extensive experience with Medicaid waivers, Meaningful Use, and the Excellence in Mental Health Act. She has worked extensively in data an analysis, including analysis of big data in support of clients and ongoing research. Her knowledge of behavioral health law has been sought out by customers across the country as they address specific needs such as electronic health record HIE implementation and the challenges of HIE. Suki received her bachelor's degree in economics from Mills College and her Juris Doctor degree from Golden Gate University. You may notice that all attendees have been muted. We are recording today's event and muting the phone lines assures the highest quality of sound. We will hold a brief question and answer session at the end of the presentation. However, we do encourage you to submit questions via the question box on the GoToWebinar panel at any time throughout the presentation. Without further ado, I will turn the floor over to Suki. Thank you so much, Angela, and I thank you all for attending. I'm looking forward to talking about this today. Um, <clears throat> we're going to talk about billing for behavioral health in 2018. The agenda is going to be a little bit about ECHO, and then um, I want to sort of get into what the various areas of the changes may be, um, and then look at kind of uh, what you're going to have to do to, to get ready for it, what kind of quality measures are people going to be looking at, and what you can do sort of taking it all together to control your own destiny. I will say also that at the end of the slide uh, presentation, not that I'll show you today but available is a brief bibliography of some of the resources that I look to when I put these presentations together. In general, as I put presentations together, I look at really three areas of, of information. I look at scholarly articles. I look at articles um, that come out of some of the trade magazines that we're all familiar with. And then I look at what the government is presenting um, to get a balanced look at the various areas that I'm going to cover. ECHO. ECHO has been in business for over 37 years. We've been privately owned. We're nestled in the lovely mountains of uh, Conway, New Hampshire. Um, and we really are proud of, our, of the 37 years of the partnerships that we've developed with our various um, customers and are particularly proud of the fact that um, we have about a history, we have our clients, about 50% of our clients have been with us over 20 years, which kind of tells you how we want to develop that partnership, sort of how I got my job as a senior knowledge engineer. Well, you've heard all about me and now you know what I look like, um, but you do get a sense of the fact that I've been at this for a long time. I've seen a lot of things come and go. I saw waivers when they were brand new and I see waivers as they come out now. Live through multiple different uh, governments and um, still keep watching and I'm still keenly uh, interested in what's going on. It doesn't seem to get boring as the years as the years progress. So what really is the state of behavioral health billing? Well the first thing is we're going to look at what are the rules today? And these are probably the things that are most familiar to you. Um, it's an anticipation of what your rules work are going to look like because nobody knows for sure. There's certainly a lot, a lot of questions coming from just the challenges that we face with this administration and what's going on in Congress and what is the, what's the intent 
um, of not only legislation for mental health and behavioral health, but also for um, the opioid crisis, and as they look at that and look at ways of funding services in the opioid crisis. Whatever those changes are going to be, you're going to need to make sure that you as an organization are ready, um, that you can adapt your technology, your data collection, your data analysis, so that you can manage for today, tomorrow, and the years to come, understanding that apparently what people like best in Medicaid is to ensure that Medicaid keeps changing. And then fin finally, we're going to talk a little bit about the quality measures. I have young kids, and I think of this always as teaching to the test. Are you going to look at quality as an independent entity, or are you going to look at quality as something that is predetermined and that therefore you have to manage your practices against that quality um, infrastructure? So where are we today? Well, many of you probably still have all or some of your services being reimbursed fee-for-service, meaning you get, you for every service you provide, you submit a claim and you get paid for that service. With um, a little bit before the Affordable Care Act, but certainly incorporated into the Affordable Care Act, was this concept of the triple aim. And the triple aim really is the beginning of, of the hint towards, towards a quality focus in the provision of health care. The idea is there's going to be better care for individuals, better health for the population, and lower cost if we can improve the quality of health care, be it care for chronic care or physical health care or behavioral health care. This is a constant theme you're going to hear, which is, can better care, what is the, really, what is behind the concept that better care will reduce the cost of care? And then finally, I'm sure you all have heard or may be being affected by MACRA, or the uh, Medicare and CHIP Reauthorization Act. It was Medicare's driving together various quality con concepts of quality care, either, um, either the merit and savement, the MIPS program, where they really were, were very set quality measures that were fairly standard, or the advanced alternative payment model, which was, gonna, which was really challenging provider groups to come up with different methods for determining quality and then and thereby getting a higher percentage back for that quality care. If we're going to look at this process, what we're going to look at is a the really the trek. It's a it is a slow movement towards alternative payment model. The idea is that within the next five to ten years, all care all reimbursement for care will be based in one way or another on quality. So what I want to do right now is take you through each of these categories that have been identified as really the pathway to capitation or full risk. We'll start with category one. This is your traditional fee for service. You're going to get paid for every service you provide. I don't want anyone to think that as I talk about quality care or uh, alternate payment methodologies that are dependent on quality, that I don't understand that you have always been, you as providers have always been, try, have been working towards providing the best, the highest quality of care that you can provide. And your clients have always expected a quality of the quality of care you can provide. You'll notice as we go along, however, there's a real difference between internal quality measures that you have within your organization and a more global concept of quality. You can decide how you want to provide care, what you consider good care, how you're going to do chart reviews and case reviews and work with your 
clinicians to train them and work with your clients towards the goals that they set. All of that may result, does result in quality care. But that's a different definition of quality that we're going to see as we move along this trek towards full risk, uh, the goal of, of, the, of new payment structures. The second de de the next category two for a change in definition of reimbursement is really how do we prepare you to be ready to really focus on quality? So the first thing, and some of you have seen it, I've seen grants from SAMHSA for this, we've seen CMS grants for this, is how do you improve your in infrastructure and set the infrastructure infrastructure up to be able to collect the kind of data that, you, that you're going to need to, um, to, pr to provide that, the results of the quality measures or to, uh, to really get to the results of the quality measures. The next step is to get you used to reporting, they will just pay for reporting. They're not looking at the outcomes of the reporting, they are looking at the very, the very facts that you reported. So we're not going to look at, did you hit 30% or 40% or 50%? It's, were you able to submit data that is in line with the quality measures that we are asking you to report upon? The next one is rewards for performance. And this is very much what you, would, what you oftentimes see from the, from the government, and that is that understanding that they have both a carrot and a stick. They always, they, they try to start with the carrot so that they will give you the benefit for the performance measures you hit or that you make or, the, or making those performance levels, but there will be no detrimental payments or, or, or um, resulting, the, re, resulting penalties if you don't meet those requirements. And then finally, you're going to get both the carrot and the stick, but you'll get rewards for, for meeting performance measures and penalties if you fail those performance measures. Each of these elements is still in a fee-for-service world. So in essence, you're getting paid, let's say, 90 cents on the dollar. And then that other 10 cents I'll keep because you didn't make your, your quality measures, or I will pay you back as a as a as a measure for quality or a reward for quality. Or perhaps if the, the service is a dollar and I will pay you 10 cents more if you make the measures for, for, as a reward for meeting quality, but you will only get 90 cents if you don't meet those measures. So it's still very much service driven. By the number of services you provide is gonna drive what that original claim is and then you'll, dri then you'll drive whatever the penalty or the reward is based on what your, um, what your quality measures, what quality measures you met, you reported upon and met. The next level begins the concept of what, what is referred to uh, as alternate payment methods, alternative payment methods. The idea of alternative payment methods are, yeah, we've been paying you fee-for-service forever, so what's an alternate way of doing it? How, what's an alternative? And alternatives can be episode-based payments. Um, that's a, uh, something that, the, that has been looked at. It can be uh, diagnosis-based or episode-based but it's going to be something other than fee-for-service. So you're not going to dr drive the reimbursement of, of your services by the number of services you provide, but by some other designation. And again, when this began, you can have a, they would give you an upside or carrot for meeting, for, for meeting a performance measure, and they would, there would be a a downside penalty if you didn't meet that performance measure. But at the first, they never brought the, the penalties didn't, it didn't engage until after the alternative payment method had been in place. And as you might expect, 
after all of these are done, what the final step is, is full risk. Now, that can, you might think of full risk as capitation, but capitation is a little bit different than what is, I'm seeing in most of the behavioral health full risk contracts. In capitation, you're going to have a catchment area, and based on the number of beneficiaries in the catchment area, you're going to get a certain dollar amount per month for every beneficiary. Your ability to make money in that world is going to be based on your um, penetration rate. What percentage of the entire catchment area actually needs and receives services? In the behavioral health world, it's been a little bit different. What they've done is they've identified levels of, levels of care, as an example. And so for the, more, uh, for the more serious levels of care or higher levels of care, you're going to get a certain amount of dollars per month. For the, less le for the lower levels of care or lower utilizers, you'll get a lesser amount per month. You're not getting anything for people who don't arrive for care, but you are getting paid for everybody who, for whom you are providing care. It's still risk because what, you're, what, the, what the, the trade off, the balance is, if you have a, ser a seriously mentally ill person that you're providing care for, there's a determination by perhaps you and, and the government or the government or the managed care entity of what that will cost per month. If it costs less per month, there's going to be a certain analysis is done. If it costs more per month, you are more likely than not at risk for that greater amount. And that's what risk is. The issue when it's lower is that most of these contracts where you have a payment for based on a level of care or a level of diagnosis, there is an expectation that you will provide a certain percentage of that a per certain percentage of the dollars that you receive each month will be used for care. If you, if you go below that amount, so let's say you have a contract and it's agreed that you will provide that 85 cents of every dollar or 85% of what you receive will be paid for care. If you fall below that 85%, then you may get a penalty. The fear is that if you fall below that 85%, are you really providing the care that your clients need and are require? I haven't seen this happen very much, but that is the fear in, in any kind of risk-based process, in any risk-based uh, reimbursement world, the concern is always that there will be a, that you will limit the amount of care you provide in order to ensure that you have enough money to cover the care that you are providing. So within this, you're going to get either, and that's really what the, this capitation concept is, the split. The condition-specific population-based payment is what, I'm, what you see mostly in behavioral health or with managed care organizations who are, cap, who are putting behavioral health organizations at risk. It is the definition of the prospective payment methodology that's being used with community behavioral health, uh, certified community behavioral health centers. The comprehensive population-based payment, often seen in physical health care, is that more, that capitated rate based on a total population, where you're looking at that penetration rate. So these are the, that, that's the process you get to. The, the real trick now is how do you prepare yourself for that process. And that's what we're going to look at right now. In order to be ready for performance-based payments and alternative payment methodologies, there's really a whole level of data that you're going to need. In order for that data, to, for you to have that data, you, the demands on your technology are going to be much greater than they've ever been in the past. There, in the time I've been in, in healthcare, I've gone from where, you know, people could really make it work by having spreadsheets. 
Their clinicians would send in pieces of paper, somebody would put it on a spreadsheet, and that spreadsheet would be turned into a claim. At the end of the day, everybody had the data they needed because nobody, they figured out care, they figured out the cost of care, and they really managed it in an old-fashioned kind of way. Um, the way that I might have managed a, a legal, my legal practice many, many years ago. But as the demands became greater, the need for technology started to develop. And now we are reaching a place where you cannot provide care, you can't meet these alternative payment methodologies without technology. Without technology that allows you to collect the data you need and provides you the, methodology, the methods to see that data, to report on that data. The second point, know the answer before asking a question. Um, when I was a lawyer, you would always talk to, you would train associates to say, never ask a question in court or even in a deposition that you didn't know the answer to. This is a little different. The reason that I'm suggesting you need to know the answer before asking a question is because the answer, it is conceivable that the answer is going to be a very difficult to, to translate into how you do business, into what your business is, into how you manage your clinical practice. You have to understand what the ground rules are before you start really doing the kind of research and asking the kind of questions that you need to do. The tools in your toolbox have to get you the data that you need. Data is a multifaceted thing now because not only are you going to need data about quality measures, you're still going to need internal quality measures met. And more than that, and maybe the most important piece, is you're going to have to start looking at the cost of doing business in ways that you hadn't considered in the past, perhaps. Oftentimes you think about the cost of having a new clinician join and you kind of know what that cost is and you figure out do you have the service array to support that clinician. In order to really understand cost though, you don't, you, you don't just need to know how much individual therapy costs. You have to understand how much it costs to have the office that the client and the therapist are sitting in. How much it costs to buy the desk, to run the air, to have the phone system. All of those things go into that 87% versus 90% of how much are you spending for care. All of those things have to be considered as you start negotiating with payers as to what, what the cost of really providing care is for you. So we've talked a lot about care. We've talked a lot about uh, the cost and what are the alternative payment methodologies. But the reality is each of these payment methodologies are built on a concept of quality. A concept of quality measures that's been identified by, the, by in this instance for Medicaid, by CMS, that's been supported by the, not, national, by the national quality uh, group, and is now being brought into your agencies as what is the standard for practice for you. The underlying premise is that value equals better care. I want to say it one more time and I want you to think about what that means. Value equals better care. Now you might say that quality equals better care. That would be a fair statement and one that we would all agree to. But how would value equals better care? That good question, I, I mean, it's a question I've been struggling with, and it, but yet I understand that it is the premise for everything that goes on in an alternative payment methodology. It is really a fight of quality versus quantity. Now, quality can be defined by evidence-based, and none of us would disagree by, with that, because evidence-based quality of, for, of care is based on who your clients are 
and proven methodologies for your client. The thing about the quality measures is so many of them were really devised with a concept of physical health and then sort of translated or modified a bit for physical health, for behavioral health. The important piece as you look at this is that clients and providers should be, and in my estimation, are paramount. But if we begin to teach towards the test, who are we really undercutting more than clients and providers? When my kids in school stopped getting taught competency-based education or, or interesting, interesting lesson plans, but began to be taught what was going to be on the test. Not only were my kids hurt, but the teachers were too, because you'd think they went into teaching to be more creative, to create lesson plans that really address the interests of their, of their, of their students. Your clinicians didn't go into practice in order to meet quality measures that have nothing to do with the practice that you're providing. And yet, it is, a, it is a challenge to keep clients and providers paramount in this process. So let's talk about quality for a minute. Quality as defined by alternative payment me measures, are defined by measures. Measures are calculated in one of two ways. They use your claim data, claims data, or they use data from your electronic health record. When they use claims data, they are using claims data, generally speaking, retroactively. So if you're going to determine care in this, met, in this period, we're going to look at your claims from last period. The challenge there is, as much as I do believe that, that clinicians are providing the very best and the highest quality of care I, they can, I don't always think that claims are the most accurate reflection of the services being provided. The diagnosis may not be exactly the diagnosis that was getting treated, that, that may not have gotten updated in the system. Your claim may have used the wrong, uh, that, the wrong uh, duration just by a little bit one, one, one way or another. But if that data is going to determine whether you're meeting quality measures, then, there is, then you, have, you start sort of with one challenge already in front of you. Are, is your claims data sufficient to kind of address the measures about when treatment occurs, how treatment occurs, is there medication being provided, et cetera, et cetera. Those kind of quality measures being brought back into your claims data presents a bit of a challenge. So in the world, there are 653, maybe a little bit more now, endorsed measures. This is, these are endorsed by the National Quality Forum. Of the 653, only 55 address behavioral health conditions. And few of those, just parenthetically, were created expressly to, to address behavioral health conditions. Rather, they were addressed, they were originally sort of proposed for the, to address the behavioral health conditions that might be treated by your primary care physician. Of the 55, only nine are outcomes. What is the outcome of your treatment? Rather than did you meet this time frame? Were you able, did you, did you prescribe one of these drugs? Did you, outcomes was, was real, is what you might think of when you think of quality measures. Perhaps more, more disappointing in some ways, only 15 of the 55 relate to substance use disorder. And yet, 
many of the of the method many of the main ways that money to treat opioid epidemic is coming into states is tied to an alternative payment methodology and this one is is sort of says the, the to me there are no outcomes that are addressing social or behavioral determinants two elements that are really i think key to understanding the quality of care in uh, in the behavioral health community or de with with respect to behavioral health services so let's talk a little bit about how, what you do in this in this sense you really need to do what you can to control your own destiny. 50% of states are currently participating in some kind of alternative payment methodology. Now this may be a true on paper performance. It may be, uh, I'm sorry, maybe a, a, a DSRIP or that integrated care program. It may be Medicaid affordable care organizations or ACOs or bundled payments, or maybe it's MCO contracts that include an alternative payment methodology. But 50% of states are, are, get, are currently implementing this. And in, and in talking to the Medicaid Directors Association, that number, they really anticipate that number growing to close to 100% within the coming years, maybe five, maybe 10, more likely five, and to get to that place in five years, there'll be a slow movement towards full risk during the course of that time. So that begs the question, do you know what your state is doing? Your, what your state is doing is going to be part of the public record. Because states do this through either their um, their state plan, which is filed with Medicaid, with Medicaid or with CMS, or waivers. In both of those instances, they have to go, they go through a public process to develop those plans, to submit those plans. And within that process, they will tell you a lot about what they're in, what, where they're going with, it, with their work. And you should know about that. Not only should you know about that, but you may want to follow that activity closely. Become a stakeholder. Most of you and many of you are probably in positions to be stakeholders where, what, where you speak not only for yourself but perhaps for your clients. Clients can be stakeholders. It's extremely important if you have a large, if you have, a, if you have clients who have an infrastructure that could, be, could provide that kind of state support, they should do it and they should uh, take the opportunity to do that. Managed care contracts are entered into by the state, and then those managed care contracts contract with entities within the state. Those managed care contracts, because they're with the state, are also public record. So you can see those, you can find those, um, and you should read those, because they'll also tell you. They'll tell you things like quality measures or goals. If you understand what the, what the managed care company owes the state for quality measures, you'll have a good idea of the direction that they're going to go with with providers that they contract with. And if I had to sort of argue for one thing you could do, it would be to monitor the development of quality measures. For alternative payment methods to work with behavioral health, it is imperative that there be quality measures that speak to the care that is being provided by you, by you, the clinicians and the agencies that are providing this care. It can be, I don't know what those look like necessarily, although as, as people that I work with know, I'm, they sh I certainly have opinions, but the reality is these need to come from you, you need to work, on, you need to work together, your provider associations, but what we shouldn't do is work with, be, work, try and be, fit ourselves into the behavioral health provided at primary care clinics. 
that's not right, that's not what we do, and that's not what we should be doing. And I, I would say one thing about that, and I think that it speaks to it. Whenever people talk about in, integrated care, nobody ever says, bring, everybody always says, let's bring a behavioral health clinician into our pr primary care practice. You rarely, if ever, hear, let's bring that doctor into our behavioral health practice. If that's, the, if that's the only definition of an integrated care, quality measures are going to be really designed for the PCPs of the world who are providing basic uh, behavioral health services, perhaps. So if you can't join the, join the task force, there's always a comment period. And it is, it's imperative that those comments get heard because change occurs because comments are heard. Change occurs because provider organizations and consumer organizations and family organizations take the, op take the opportunity to express their frustration with what might be going on and, and ask and demand change. Some things that, a couple of things that, that have been done um, are, I talked about episodes of care. And there have been a couple of things that, have, that people have tried to do. When episodes of care were discussed, as an example, talking about a square peg in a round hole, the first thing CMS did is they realized that if a person has a heart attack, that quality care says they should do, that, that these are the steps that should be taken, and based on that, here is the cost of the episode of care for a heart attack. Now, episode of care is one way, one alternative payment method. Well, this behavioral health conditions really can't be defined in such an easy way, but they have tried a couple that are interesting and I thought you might be interested in. One is called PCOAT. It's a patient-centered opioid addiction treatment. And this says that if you begin medication a medication assisted treatment and you go through that protocol the the episode of care will begin with that bundle will, will begin with that medicaid medical me, medic, medical assistance treatment and follow it through towards uh, receiving outpatient care through uh, some recovery so you get the concept of a neatly defined episode that may fit with some some persons some percentage of the population. Also, ba based on the, the the research that was being done about first episode of psychosis, there is also a bundle that's being looked at for that for the treatment that comes if you get if if you're actually starting treatment with that first episode of psychosis, so that you can really where people where where researchers have found you can make a difference, they're really defining an episode to get to that particular point in time. So there is opportunity to look at the care that we provide and see how we might, rather than being a square peg in a round hole, look at the places where we are actually, where both the hole and our care are round that we can look at redefining things, but defining them on our terms. First episode of psychosis was defined on the terms of behavioral health providers and researchers. Um, the patient-centered opioid addiction treatment was based on the research done by behavioral health providers and clients and providers. If we do that, and if we commit to doing that, then as these years progress to, to a full risk, what we will have is a risk-based system that we look at and say that is our system. We're not being pushed into it as a round peg in a square hole. Both the peg and the hole match up just the way you want them to. And it can be done. There are people who have come up with quality measures that meet a better concept of what you want quality measures to be for behavioral health folks. There are episodes that have been defined in a way that make real sense. 
And if we can rely on those, if we can move towards those, then you will control your own destiny. And this talk won't be the talk we have in five years, but we'll talk about the gains that we've made and the kind of quality, the research we've been able to do because of the quality of the quality measures that really look at the clients that we serve and the, and the challenges that we face in the behavioral health community. With that, if there are questions, I am happy to answer questions, and I want to thank you for um, listening to the last several minutes of, of my talk. Suki, we have a couple of questions that have uh, uh, come through throughout the course of the conversation, but let me start with the, the last one first. Uh, you were just talking about uh, a reference to some uh, examples of of communities or states or uh, providers who have done a really good job at lining up uh, the, uh, the outcomes, uh, the quality measures with uh, behavioral health as opposed to you know, the, the square peg. Uh, can you give examples of uh, communities, regions, states of, uh, where that has been done uh, well or exceptionally, exceptionally well? I don't know too many states who have completely adopted these. What these are, are well, the two that I mentioned and are, are all isolated pilot programs, most oftentimes funded by SAMHSA, to look at, to accept um, quality of care measures that are from the community, and then they will put that out there. So there are eight provider agencies throughout the country who have been given the opportunity, based on those SAMHSA grants, to really try and provide that kind of care in that kind of direction. The research for it, um, I think there are some, in the bibliography, there are some sites to it, and if not, uh, there, you can get back to me and I, can, I do have that research if I didn't put it in the bibliography. But it's really not at the state level, it's still at the, at the provider agency level where they're trying to, to sort of check, try this out and see how this works and if it in fact is a measure, is a set of measures that, that can be repeatable. Earlier you mentioned uh, or referenced uh, the idea that claims data was being used uh, to measure or gauge performance. Can you, uh, one, explain who is using claims data and then uh, drill down a little bit further into uh, what that means, how they're using it, and what the uh, repercussions could be. So the either both CMS and the states are using claims data. If you ever, if you reviewed the um, the RFP for the CCBHCs as an example, the Community Behavioral Health Cent uh, uh, Certified Community Behavioral Health Centers. In the list of quality measures that were identified at the, uh, within that RFP, they identified measures that would be based on claims data versus EHR data. The CMS is using it um, in different ways, but most often what they're looking at is the, the, the time from a hosp uh, in put inpatient to the first uh, appointment outside of the inpatient, to diagnosis compared to medications, because they have data from both the diagnostic, both diagnosis ways and with medications, and just time between ap appointments, uh, between services, based on diagnosis, based on other criteria. Um, another way, and this is truly parenthetical, Another way that data is being looked at is to determine, and I appreciate, well, I won't go into it, but I understand that people use claims data for many things, things like parity to ensure that there's coverage in the state, things like quality, like I've talked about. So that claims data has, has a life well beyond the point of time where you send it to your Medicaid entity and they pay you and then they reimburse you for some percentage of it. Once CMS gets it, they use it, or the state gets it, they are going to use it for quality measures, to determine network coverage, to determine uh, availability of care, um, and what they are, the quality measures that they can, that are completely data-driven without um, 
with no kind of inference or inferential uh, data required. Suki, you mentioned uh, also uh, earlier the idea of uh, organizations needing to really uh, understand their cost of doing business. What did you mean by that? Historically, costs have been de de determined by what's an hour of therapy cost. And there, was, there were ways of calculating that or people just got a sense of it or better yet or worse yet, it was based on what the reimbursement rate was. To understand what it costs you to do business, which is really the def defining term of, of risk, you have to understand, so you understand the cost of doing business. You know what the cash flow is required to make payroll to do those things. But, do you, uh, but you have to be able to understand it in terms of the various people that you serve. So if I, what does it cost me to serve somebody who is a low utilizer? What does it cost me to serve somebody who's seriously mentally ill? I have to understand that. So what I need to know is what does it cost for my waiting room? What does it cost for the front desk? What does it cost for my computer system? For the, I sometimes say, and it's not very, it's kind of um, tongue in cheek, what does it cost for the air that I breathe? What is, the, what is the per person cost of my agency? And then of that cost, how do, I def how do I separate it out between the various groupings of people, uh, diagnostically, diagnostic groupings of people we serve? And that's going to be um, a key identifier. And to do that, what you're really doing is taking that cost of service and then adding to it all the other elemental costs that you have yet, you've never really thought about when you think about what your reimbursement rate will be for a given service in fee-for-service. So as you go through that exercise, what role does shadow billing play in that and how can that uh, help an organization get a, uh, its hands around? Shadow billing really will come into effect once you are on a, in a, some kind of total risk base. So the minute you stop billing on a fee-for-service basis, you're going to do shadow billing. And shadow billing is, is in counter-based billing, so it's a zero dollar amount. But every service has a cost associated with, so your system knows what that cost is. If you think back to when we were talking about um, the percentage rate of dollar that you must spend if you're in a risk-based system, the way you know you spent it is because based on the services you've provided, based on the claim that you've submitted, you know you've done 15 of this service and 20 of this service. That translates to a dollar amount. That's the dollar amount we're going to look at to see if you've hit the percentage rates. But so really, the encounter billing or shadow billing becomes important after you've done the initial analysis. Because once you've hit shadow billing, you are already in a risk-based uh, market. So you, you will already need to know the cost of your doing service. You mentioned earlier about, uh, about outcomes uh, being akin to teaching to the, the, uh, to the test. Um, could the process of reporting outcomes, uh, defining that and reporting outcomes, affect how an organization uh, provides care? Most certainly. Because the whole thing about teaching to the test is, I'm going to look at it in a very, in, in kind of a uh, unnecessarily kind of uh, yes and no environment. Um, I've dealt with agencies who deal with depression and other diagnoses but do not believe in medication. They are, they um, believe in, uh, they may be out in the wilderness and they're wilderness providers, etc. But they do get reimbursed by Medicaid. If they don't medicate their folks who are, de de uh, who are diagnosed with depression, they aren't meeting one of the quality requirements. 
Why would that be? Well, the people at Medicaid believe that if we medicate folks with depression, they will need less care. It's my guess is what they believe. So here's the definition. We've now defined quality of care because we've given medication even in a world where we don't believe we should, and now we need less care. So the quality of care has risen. We know this because people need less care because that medication is doing what is believed to be managing their depression in a world where, and that would change my, either I have two choices in that world. I can stop getting Medicaid or I have to change the way I practice. The other place where I see it is with people with severe psychosis. If, if I go into the hospital because I need to, and you resolve and I get back on my meds or I do things, I think it looks as if it's resolving. But then I go back in in 30 days because I'm not managing my life and I'm, I'm a danger to myself or others. You haven't failed as an organization. I'm, I suffer from an illness that makes it so you can't always guarantee that I will stay out of the hospital for 30 days or 60 days. And which brings me, which reminded me of something I didn't say about quality. The other challenge with quality is that quality measures have a percent, derive a percentage. So you need 85% of people doing this or 60%. That's not based on case mix. So if you have a caseload of seriously persistently mentally ill people, and that's your entire caseload, no quality measure has ever looked at, has ever validated itself against that case mix. So the, the case mix is an additional challenge that, that is faced when defining quality because what your case mix is could very much determine how you meet certain quality requests, quality measures. You are re reaching a measure at a lesser percentage than somebody that has a different case mix may actually be really quite acceptable, but not if the standards are not based on case mix uh, on on the on the mix of your cases. Are there strategies or organizational changes uh, a uh, provider could make to uh, compensate for a circumstance like that? I guess what you would have to see is where, I wouldn't know the answer to that until we, until this is something that you want to do in a quality, when quality measures are, are driving you. You need to look at those quality measures regularly throughout a year and not just at the end of the year. So I think what I would do is look at those quality measures early on and try and determine if there's some way, if I'm underneath them because of my case mix, is there a way that I can moderate that or modulate that or is there something I can do? Um, because there's not, it, if your case mix is your case mix, until behavioral health providers have a seat at the table in determining quality measures, case mix is not going to be a, a concern because it's not seen as a, such a great concern in a physical health world because of the case mix that most PCPs have. Of the uh, uh, nearly 650 quality measures uh, that are defined, um, and only 55 are related to uh, uh, behavioral health, are there other measures that aren't included that you think would would benefit to the folks in behavioral health care? Yes, and there's an article that I've attached in um, in, in the bibliography, and, it, and they are measures that deal with functional and, and behavioral, behavioral measures. What was the quality of my life for the last week? If I am seriously and persistently mentally ill, did I get out of bed for seven days? Or measures that, I'm not saying that that's the measure, what I'm saying is that measures that make sense for your population. And those measures have been have been recommended, and they are written about, and and have been identified in. And this is why I read academic articles because within academic articles, 
if I see measures like that, it means that they've tested them somewhere. So I know that they have valid that they validated the quality of the, the measures, those measures against populations. And what the measures have to be, given your population, what is the goal that you have for one or more of the persons in your population? And they isn't going to be the same. One may be to go to work. One may be to get out of bed. It, it isn't, there is no one size fits all. And that's the value of functional and behavioral uh, quality measures. Is that is not, it is not, they are not identified as one size fits all. You talked a bit about uh, MCOs and the, the role they, they play in a state-by-state -state, uh, basis. And you referenced negotiating rates with MCOs. Can you uh, talk a little bit about the process of negotiating rates with MCOs? Uh, and uh, for organizations who've never done it before, uh, what are things they need to keep in mind? How do they know that they're negotiating the best possible rate? Um, You don't know you're negotiating the best possible rate, but here's the, the kicker. If it's a behavioral health man, uh, managed care company, at the end of the day, they should only retain four to eight percent, or four to eight cents on every dollar that they get from the state. So you should, you and the other pr providers should be getting 96 percent of the dollars, or between 92 and 96 percent. The state will manage care con the managed care contracts will say how much money they're getting. The challenge is you may not know how another agency has what their negotiations have been like. You may want to gather together, and I know they've done that in some states, and have a single point of, of point for negotiations. That works. But even if you do that, I would keep an eye on that group and make sure that, that they understand that you get, that that managed care company really shouldn't get more than four to eight cents on the dollar. Anything above that is just, that means that's four to eight cents to manage administrative costs only. They're not providing direct care. So it is reasonable to say that only eight cents out of a dollar should go to administrative costs. In the best, in, when I started in managed care, and I did, four cents was what administrative entities got. That's it. That's the most they ever got. But with Medicaid populations and the like, it did increase, and that's where the eight cents come in. I have seen states where that percentage is much higher. It gets into the double digits. That shouldn't be. So the starting factor is, what is the dollar amount that you can have? And then the second thing is, understand your costs as I discussed, and then, maybe get, and then maybe group together with a set of providers who can have a stronger position to negotiate than a single provider will have. Is there a way to uh, find out or determine uh, or, uh, the, uh, the audit process of an MCO and find out what the percentage you receive actually is? They'll get whatever. It, yes, there is. A, they're they're publicly audited. It's a public contract. Um, they the state contract will identify how much money they're getting. The state will keep tabs on how much they're spending and what they're spending it on. Many of the managed care con contracts that have uh, been fallen the way of bad contracts are ones where the managed care contracts, where the administrative costs have gone out of hand gotten out of hand and they aren't, the managed care companies have proven they can't afford to do, continue to do business. It's hard to do, but you're going to have to track the monies that go from the state to the managed care companies. And I, I assure you from my own experience, it can be done. Um, it's sometimes challenging and they sometimes, the sh water shift a little underneath them. So you're not sure that, that one dollar is the same as another dollar, but you can get a good sense of what the managed care company is keeping, uh, what their percentage is, and what percentage is going to providers. And 
Finally, Suki, this is the last question that uh, came through. With the uncertainty uh, in the next year, in particular, surrounding the Affordable Care Act, what would you offer as, uh, what's the best advice you could give an organization uh, to prepare for the unknown uh, with regard to reimbursement and uh, what that looks like uh, uh, coming up in the immediate future, uh, midterm, and still have an eye towards the long term? Well, I would say two things. MACRA came out with a um, uh, their 2018 update um, legislation, which is open for comments now. And based on that, uh, based even, I mean, that came out of HHS, and even with the unknown about Medicare, that they're staying the course with APMs and um, with the same kind of methodology that they've been talking about. If what is the alternative that, that the Congress has been talking about is um, block grants. And I am guessing that if a state gets a block grant, given the work that is being done by Medicaid directors, you will still see, there will still be a desire to have that as a, at a risk-based method. Um, they're not, I don't think that there's a state in the country really who thinks that they can go back to fee-for-service and survive. So I don't know with the Affordable Care Act, with, with, with what it's going to do for the seriously mentally ill folks. We've seen, and was just, an email went out today in fact, about the states who are putting requirements for work in for the, the Medicaid population that came on as an additional Medicaid population. I don't know what will happen with them. I, that, that's, that's where the bigger question lies. But very much of the, um, much of what's being done from the, much of what's being done from at the state, at the federal level, really deals more with the extended and extended Medicaid. The seriously, persistently mentally ill, it's a, still will have some service, still will have some dollars, but it could be block grants, which could really seriously challenge the total amount of dollars versus the total amount of need. So my guess is, no matter what happens, be prepared for risk-based contracts because that's probably the only way they're going to have to really move into block grants or um, any other uh, funding that, that Congress thinks about. Any uh, final parting bits of wisdom, Suki? Feel free to get in touch with me if you have questions. And good luck. I, you can, this is doable. Um, but I can imagine that some of it is a little bit overwhelming, and I, I wish you all the luck, and I believe completely that we, that as an industry, we will figure out our way through this to a place where this kind of talk is like old school, and new school is really innovative thought processes around treatment, around payment methodologies, around quality measures. And thank you. Thank you for that, Suki. Um, as a reminder, I just want to let all participants know that they will receive an email in the next few days containing a link which will allow you to download a PDF copy of the presentation and listen to a video file of today's presentation. Um, I also um, wanted to thank you all for joining us for Billing for Behavioral Health, Top 5 Issues Facing Agencies in 2018, brought to you by the ECHO Group and Open Minds. Thank you to our presenter, Suki Norris, for joining us today and to our audience for attending this session. Have a wonderful day.